Hi, this is Misty Capture. You're listening to The Rock Stop with Chris Concha. Welcome into The Rock Stop. Chris Contra here. My guest tonight starred in one of USA Network's highest rated shows, the crime drama Silk Stockings. She played Sergeant Rita Lance. She then went on to work alongside David Hasselhoff on the wildly popular series Baywatch as Alex Riker. I am, of course, talking about Mitzi Capture. How's it going, Mitzi? Good, good, Chris. How are you? I'm doing good. I appreciate you being here. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Definitely. <laughs> and happy holidays to everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And to you as well. Now, uh, for people who may not have watched Silk Stockings on its original run, uh, the show, I guess you kind of explain it like, um, I, I mean, it has like elements of law and order, but with a much more, much more humor and much more, I guess, sex appeal as well. And a little spunk in there as well. The characters, I, I feel like we got to play them with a little twinkle in our eye some of the some of the terminology the cop terminology we used and that david peckinpah and stephen cannell uh the executive producer and creator of the show uh stephen cannell they you know i mean some of that jargon when i first started using it i was like does anybody talk like this but you know you sort of get in the rhythm of it i think one of the phrases i'm trying to remember was like that guy is like a um a taco short on a combination plate. It's like, <laughs> what? It made it fun after, you know, after I sort of stepped into it. I think it's the same thing, you know, with like um, people that are on hospital shows like Grey's Anatomy or different, you know, lawyer shows. It's like you get into this rhythm with the jargon. And, <laughs> and I just think Stephen Cannell and some of the writers, you know, took it next level and just really had fun with it. Yeah. Which, seem to really resonate with the audience yeah definitely and uh and now so who was cast first you or rob estes i went in on an audition gosh i feel like it was on the weekend but maybe not um and i went in with david peckinpah who was one of the executive producers and um a casting director named simon air who was always super friendly and nice and just made you feel so comfortable or made me feel comfortable we're almost like brother and sister, you know, when I go in and read. And um, so I read for them. And at one point, one of the scenes, one scene was really dark that I am have a brain aneurysm and I haven't told my partner or something and I'm having a headache. And so that was one of the audition scenes I remember very clearly. And um, I'm kind of trying to hide that yeah. element, which is a pretty dark you know, sto- sub storyline way down deep. Yeah. They never really played it heavy. And then they said, um, we want you to go meet Stephen Cannell. He is just such a rock star and gentleman and classy. And I went into his office on Hollywood Boulevard. I think he had a fireplace in his office. It was <laughs> all dark wood, you know, nice, yeah. and he's just in a class of his own. And so I had that. And then they, uh, they said, okay, we're going to have you come in and test with a bunch of people. So it was me, and I, and I kept getting, they want you. We just got to find the guy. Oh, okay. And so finally, the I had to go in twice. And the last time, they said, we're not going to bring any other girls, but we can't cast you till we cast the guy because it's really, it really, you know, has to be about chemistry. Oh, and we wow. just haven't found that guy yet. But, but I mean, so that's so, interesting because like they had you there. They're not bringing in other actresses. They liked you for right. the part, but they didn't really want to give you the the uh, the job until they had the guy. Well, I, I think, you know, I mean, they told my agents they wanted me, but I mean, they didn't ask me to sign a yeah. contract until till the whole picture made sense. Right. Know? So it that sounded show like. was such a yeah. runaway train the way. I mean, that all happened like probably in five days. And as soon as we were cast, I feel like that was a Friday. And again, Rob and I, um, I, I read with probably six or eight guys and they all had a completely different take on his character. But then when Rob and I started to rehearse before we had to go in the room for like 30 executives, 
because it was like all these people from CBS and all these people from USA because it was two networks yeah. um, that produced it. And Rob did something. He got frustrated and he swore, just went like, fuck, you know, whatever it was. <laughs> and, um, and we started laughing and then they were like, okay, we're ready for you guys. And so we couldn't even hardly look at each other in the audition because we were still on the verge of laughing from that moment that just happened. I think that's ultimately what carried over, you know, yeah. for the whole, the whole show. So, I mean, like, yeah, you, when you work with somebody for as long as you did uh, with uh, Rob on that show for, what was it, about five seasons? Yeah, we did five seasons, and then the show went on to eight seasons. It was um, Stephen Cannell's longest-running show. You know? So when you first read the so, script, did you, I mean, did you, what did you see as the potential for this show? Did you think that it would really, uh, you know, catch on the way it did? I had no clue. And it happened so fast that obviously two networks believed in it. Yeah. So that was, that was appealing to me. Just that idea that, um, I don't think it had ever been done before. I don't know if people do that now, even honestly, I haven't really paid attention to it, but I, I haven't really seen it where sh like two networks, they get to split the cost. So it costs them half as much to have a whole show. And I just thought, oh, that will be great to be on two networks. That really appealed to me. Initially, we were only, con you know, we only were picked up for like 11 episodes or something like that, maybe 13. And then like probably a couple months in, um, Stu Siegel came on the set at the end of a really long day and he goes, well, I've got some news. And he was like, we just got picked up for the back nine. So meaning nine more episodes. And I just was like, Oh, <laughs> like, okay. So I really have to pace myself. I don't, I don't think I ever, I ever thought that because I had bought a small little house in Los Angeles. I would say probably a couple months before I got silk and then. When I went down there, first they put us up in a nice hotel, and then they, you know, moved us to apartments. Rob and I had apartments side by side, which is pretty funny. Oh wow! And then, and then we, you know, I ended up renting a condo. I never, I never thought, oh, I should buy down here and sell my house in L.A. I, ne I never thought I was going to be spending that much time down there. Yeah, you just don't know, right? You know, so yeah. But I, luckily, you know. It's, great place to be san diego right <laughs> definitely beautiful area so um yeah. the uh the sh I, I thought the marketing of the show was done very well like commercials mm -hmm. i always remember the commercials you know growing up watching like uh you know anything on the usa network the silk stockings commercials always stuck out more than anything else i thought well you know again that Stephen cannell he's so great at creating the whole vibe around the show I mean, if you remember, like, 21 Jump Street had such a vibe and, like, Rockford Files. Right. And, you know, I think it also I have to give kudos to Mike Post, who um, was hired to do the uh, the opening music. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, you know, first of all, the eye candy that was in the opening sequence. Right. And then, you know, then that sound, it just, there was no other sound like it on a show at that time. That. I mean, before NYPD Blue and, you know, all those shows that sort of took off after. And uh, the name Silk Stockings, like what exactly, what is that? that Stockings yeah. like a stalker because the show was based on um, high profile crimes of passion. So just about every show, the opening act would be, the setup would be usually like a high profile senator, you know, or is, you know, a judge or like all these different things. And then like some young girl he's having an affair with or something to do with business. Like it was just all these twists. And yeah. then, then somebody was found dead and it's like, wait a minute, who did what and who did who? And yeah. that's just we go in and asking all those questions, like what was happening? <laughs> and, and it just, sometimes it'd be so twisted. You just go, you know, and now a lot of those storylines, because, you know, I was in the beginning and at first I was like, the show was pretty, you know, kind of dark. And when I first started doing that show, I was like, oh, this kind of feels weird to be part of. But then then I like pretty quickly I went, oh, so my character is like walking through this 
she I narrated the show. Stephen had me do like the the voiceover, kind of like like um, Tom Selleck did with Magnum PI. Yeah, right. So I I would narrate it, but um, but then I was like, oh yeah, she's really walking through this, trying to find out who the bad guys are, and I was like, that's kind of a cool thing right yeah you know hooked into that you know it was okay i i I liked i liked playing that character you of course would know that character better than just about anybody after you were playing her for so long so did you feel that you could go to the uh writers and and say you know i think she should do this or i think she should do that and you want to change things about her as the show went along um sure i mean you know for instance that storyline i told you about when i was hired uh i was told that she had a brain aneurysm and I think they played that storyline in the first episode, which Stephen wrote, the pilot. But then what happened was there would be these different characteristics of someone who had like a, you know, a fatal disease or something. Um, but they would never deal with it. Like I was never going to the doctors. I never talked about it, but like I never got involved in a romantic relationship, you know, because I could die, <laughs> you know, yeah. occasionally there'd be a little drop about it. And finally, after the first season, I said to Stephen Cannell, like, why, why did you create her with a brain aneurysm? Cause we're not really following through on that. I'm just curious. Like, what should we do about that? <laughs> yeah. And I, I think he said, well, I wanted to create a woman who could, she was living every day. Like it was her last day. You know, going out there kissing ass and, you know, and I was like, well, I think I can do that without being on the verge of dying. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of, um, we've dropped that storyline. And then, um, there was, yeah, I mean, you know, I'd say in the first season, even, um, in the beginning, you know, when you're just getting to know the executive producers and the writers and stuff, I, you know, you feel weird about some dialogue, but you're like, I got to make this work and all this stuff. But after a while, um, what I recognized is that the dialogue would flip into my memory bank really easily if, if it was organic to my character. Mm -hmm. But if, if a scene, a scene seemed off, like what, what I was saying and all this, I would suddenly I'd go, Oh, that's because she wouldn't say that. That's why I can't memorize this. And that's why I'm getting. So I would just go to Stephen, I mean, to David Peckinpah, and I just say, you know, I I don't think she'd say this because I can't digest it. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. And he would go, well, what do you, what do you, you know, we got, we had a, developed a good relationship where he knew I wasn't just being a pain in the ass, you know. <laughs> and he'd go, what do you think she would say? And so, you know, we'd work on stuff, or we'd change a scene, and you know, there was um, one scene, and this is kind of funny because it's before I did Baywatch um there was one scene where uh they had me coming out of the ocean in a bathing suit and I just thought oh no if I do this I'm gonna be in a bathing suit for the rest of my life you know (laughs) and so I just said you know what she's a cop I don't I don't think we need to do that you guys have enough you know with all the other characters and stuff and they go well what do you think she'd be wearing if she was coming because we have to bring in Chris to find her at the be- oh, you know the beach or whatever, and I go, she'd be surfing in a wetsuit. She's an athletic chick, so that's what we did, you know. So they they were really receptive. I really appreciated it, and you know, really respectful of um, sort of just the whole process. Of that's finding the character. So they did they let you also come up with some of your own uh, lines and things. I mean, you kind of said, you know, they ask you like, what would she say, and then they would actually use that. What you would suggest. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, David and I would just talk it through. And I just, I really do feel fortunate because that experience, it was just so many things were so cool about it. And the crew, oh, my gosh, I still, like, stay in touch with a lot of the the crew. Um, And, you know, we were just like, just like a family. Yeah. Um, And they, they were all so supportive. They, you know, they didn't complain. And the hours were atrocious for them, too. And. Um, we all just kind of like supported each other. We had huddles every Friday. Um, we do like a group huddle and then we'd all hug, um, and, and then blast the music, you know, just to, cause we knew Fridays would be a really long day going cause they had the weekend off. You know, it was like a real team effort, but it was also cool because, um, 
since we were in San Diego, it was great because we could come back, which I usually didn't have the energy to come back to LA, but um, we could. It was close enough to make the drive, but also it was just far enough away that no no network executives were bo- bothered us at oh, all. That's sweet. I mean, I, yeah, a couple times we get notes. We were like, God, it's like we're down here like doing kind of whatever we want almost, <laughs> you know, right. within parameters. But um, yeah, I felt really lucky about that, just being slightly off grid. Kind of gives you like a sense of freedom throughout uh, your time totally. there. Yeah. I, I recently had on a, an actor from The Sopranos who was telling me that there was no room for any improvisation or anything like that. So, I mean, it's really cool to wow. hear. Well, yeah, if you don't leave room to breathe, um, creativity gets just choked, yeah. I think. Uh, yeah. You know, I worked on one project. I won't say the name. It was um, a movie, and the director was so... Um, he, and, and, you know, I respect it because I respect the written word and I respect writers a lot, but he just, because he had lived with his script so long, he, he knew how he wanted every syllable said. Yeah. And, and I think that just becomes like, you know, maybe he's happy because he's like, you know, but it, it just, it really takes the joy out of the whole process. Uh, yeah, you know? I totally agree. Now I did want to go back. Uh, you were mentioning how you, there was that scene where your character was coming out of the ocean and you, you didn't want her seen in a bathing suit at that time. Now, was that more for the, uh, for you cut, thought that wouldn't suit the character or was that kind of a personal thing? I'd say both <laughs> heavy duty on both. <laughs> Cause I really, you know, I just thought it was completely unnecessary for someone portraying a cop, you know, be coming out of the shower or coming out of the ocean or whatever it is. It's like, we want to respect her and take her seriously. Right. Um, but so, I mean, you know, I did enough undercover stuff where I'd be in tight dresses and all that stuff. And so I wasn't like I was a prude. I just thought, you know, yeah. there's a line, but also who would want to like do that every day if you're working 16, 18 hour days. It's like, oh no. Uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> yeah, you didn't want to set nope. a, you didn't want to set a precedent. Yeah. Um so do you feel that the show ended uh, around the right time? I do. I mean, you know, the show itself, um, you know, I didn't you know, as I don't know if you know, but the this season, um, my character well, not my character, I personally um decided to to have my first child, Madison, and um, and so I was pregnant, and they, and I didn't tell anyone on the show, um, except for I think like the attorney, so somebody knew, hmm. um, for legal reasons. But um, I, I just I said I don't want anyone to talk about it. I don't want anyone to know because you know I want to get so far along and not be treated any differently and stuff. And so, um. Probably once everyone acknowledged it when I was about three, we were three months in and they were so kind and sweet and all that stuff, but they didn't introduce it in the storyline until I was like five and a half months. So it just looked like, oh, Rita's gaining a little weight. (laughs) And so, (laughs) so I just, you know, I walked with big purses and file folders and like, you know, just, we just sort of, you know, hit it a little bit, but, um, it's, it's pretty wild. Yeah. To work those kind of hours when you're pregnant, there's a a human being growing inside you and you're pretending not to be pregnant, you know, it it is pretty wild, but you know, I mean, I would say, yes, I, at the end of my time at 101 episodes, I, um, you know, those last five shows, well, I don't want to spoil it for anybody if they haven't seen it, but those last five shows were pretty emotionally intense yeah. and especially the last episode I did. And so when I drove from San Diego back to LA, I had about a month before I was going to have my daughter and I like, I didn't look back. It was like, okay, now I get to focus on, <laughs> you know, being a mom. Yeah. And, you know, it's just so beautiful. So for me, it ended at the exact right time. And I was blessed. Yeah. A beautiful daughter. 
Awesome. That's great. Now you said uh, at five months they introduced your pregnancy into the storyline. So before that, like uh, the previous four months you were pregnant, that nobody really knew and you just continued to film just like regular? Uh, um, for the first about three, three and a half. Yeah, I didn't want anyone to know because um, you didn't, yeah, you didn't want because. to be treated different and things. Um, I, but I yeah. do know that the show was kind of a physical show. I mean, did that weigh on your mind right. at all that like, you know, some sequences might come up? Um, you know, I, I don't know that I thoroughly thought that through because being pregnant was new to me as well. And I thought, oh, I can do everything. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, once we, everyone knew, you know, we did, you know, we were careful Obviously, my pregnancy was the most important thing. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, we didn't do any of those scenes where like, there were some scenes where like Rob would be driving a car and and then, you know, he'd almost stop and I'd jump out of the car and run in heels. But <laughs> we didn't do any of that kind of stuff even if I was pregnant. You yeah, know? <laughs> that's good. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I mean... I was, I remember those saying to Rob once we were doing something and it it was kind of physical. And I just said, you know, think of my future daughter, <laughs> you know, like be really careful when the cameras are rolling. Definitely. And, yeah. Know. Right. Yeah. Did you have any uh, injuries like in the previous seasons before that last season, like from some of that physical stuff and how much of that stuff was really you doing it? Um. Yeah. I mean, I did do a lot and I enjoyed it. I mean, I really, I like being physical. I like, handling a gun I like you know I like all that stuff and it, and it you know it's great because you're not just like talking heads you're actually moving and you're physical but um uh yes I was injured in the seasons previously not bad but enough yeah um and not from the stunts I was doing but like I'd have to say honestly from other actors <laughs> that like if they would come, this one person came in to guest star and uh, it was a fe it was a female and she was supposed to, you know, on camera, take my arm and pull it behind me and yank it up my back. And then we got into this whole um, fighting team, which we did have stunt doubles and they were amazing um, that it, it, for different angles on the fight. Like we do the fight all the way through and then they would come in for the very tighter shots of it yeah. with the punches and all that stuff. But, um, but I said to her, she kind of yanked when in rehearsal, she kind of pulled my arm up kind of hard. And I said, you know, I can act that. So like you, you really don't have to do it all the way up. Like you can just, cause the camera's on the front of us on the front of me. So when you pull my arm behind me, like you're yanking it, I go, just give it that motion and I'll, I'll act it, you know, right. the pain. So anyway, because, you know, when you're coming in for a guest star, you're just running into something and you're not familiar with it. Yeah. But anyway, it, and it happens like actors, adrenaline are going. And of course, when they said action and she did it, she like, it ripped my shoulder muscle. Oh. Quite. And for years, like I, you know, I had to be really careful doing push-ups and, you know, different exercises like that. I was aware of it. Let's just say that. I oh, was like, man. Oh. That sucks. But, but not much. Not Yeah, but, you know, compared to how much I did. The, yeah, right. Know, I was, yeah, there was, there was not. I just had a lot of bruises, and that's just because I bruise easily. <laughs> you know, I did it myself. And uh, that's too bad, though, that, uh, that, that one, you know, sometimes a freak incident like that one happens. Uh, but, yeah, yeah. I guess that's when you. Yeah, I just say that in case any actors are listening. That stuff can happen, you know. But also, you know, that you can act um, pain. Right. You don't yeah. have to physically actually go through it. Now, I did want to ask you about uh, Baywatch when you went over and did Baywatch. This was already a mm -hmm. very established show. So, how did it feel going back into TV after uh, after some time away? Well, I had done that's what the, I, I had done a couple movie of the week um, in between, so I you know I was used to, used to it, but um, but like a series is a, is a different animal. Right. Um, but the good thing is, is like the creator Greg Bonan, he told me he said you know the thing that'll be great if you accept the offer because they made an offer to me which was lovely. Um, he said, is that you can bring your daughter to set. She can play on the beach. 
And because we shoot when the sun is out, it you'll never have longer than a 12-hour day, which just sounded like a dream. That's a it's great working environment. Yeah, it, and, it, and it was. And I have to, you know, they, they chose, that. I guess at that point, when they invited me on, they um, scaled down the characters and there was, you know, they went from like this big sort of cast to um, David Hasselhoff, from what I was told, he, he wanted to um, sort of reorganize the show and have it become a little more serious. And he wanted me as his sparring partner. Sort yeah. of. And um, so they, they we only had three, three females and three males um, that season. And so that was a really tight knit group and it was great, you know, six instead of two, like me and Ross. It was, um, <laughs> yeah. it was nice because it, it wasn't so, so, um, long and arduous, the dialogue and all that. Stuff. Right. Exactly. Now, would you, now for being on a show like that, I imagine you, you got to be a pretty strong swimmer. Well, you know, interestingly enough, I, when I got the call, I, was on a family vacation and I was like, Oh no, really? <laughs> I, I haven't swam in so long. Um, I mean, I did as a kid. I think a lot of people are that way, you know? Yeah. Um, so I went, I drove, uh, you know, on this vacation to a local Y and jumped in a pool and I was like, okay, I can remember <laughs> this. And then, <laughs> and then I went back and yeah. So, um, I wasn't, but I did have a pool at the time, and I started swimming laps in the pool to get up my strength because, you know, even though you're acting, oh, my gosh, some of those scenes, um, there was one scene where I had to jump off the second floor, floor of this moving boat in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> I had to throw a life preserver, dive out while the boat was moving, and wow. there was another boat with a camera on it filming, so it had to be very synchronized. And my hair was dry, so I only had one take to get it. Oh, wow. You know, once your hair is yeah. wet, you know. So it that kind of stuff. And then I had to rescue like a six foot one or a six foot three guy, which you can act that stuff. But when you're in the middle of actually, you're really in the middle of the ocean. It's pretty wild. Some of the stuff that um, I was like, whoa, what am I doing? They're like, just throw the raft and then just die. You know? <laughs> I'm like, okay. I always thought that was really cool about Baywatch, though, that they uh, they were really in the elements. That whole franchise is so amazing. And I actually just spoke with the creator, Grace Bonan, about a week ago. Um, and... He, I guess, you know, he's he's really an interesting and smart guy. He, you know, he used to be a lifeguard himself, and, and he rescued this young boy, and then it turns out the young boy's dad was Grant Tinker, who was a, you know, pretty big executive, and he came to Greg's house and, like, wanted to compensate him for saving his son's life, and Greg said, like, no, I don't, that's my job. I don't want to get paid for that. No. But I do have a show concept to pitch too. Oh, wow. So that started and he took that and ran with us. Recently, um, last year, I think he remastered the whole yeah. thing so that it can be, you know, um, released digitally everywhere. And he just told me last week, he was like, you know, the show is number one in the world last year. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, I, I just get this information from other people. Like, I have no clue. You know, it's pretty bizarre. I, I've been, I That's actually cool. been watching the remastered version. It's on like Amazon Prime and stuff. And uh, it, I mean, it, it looks better than it's ever looked. I mean, the, they, they really uh, enhance the video footage as, uh, as much as I've ever seen. I mean, I wish they would do that with other shows, but man, does it look good. And for a visually appealing show like that, it really, it really pays off. Well, I'll have to tell him you said that. I'm sure that was a lot of work, and I'm sure he would appreciate that. Yeah, just tell everyone to watch season nine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did just recently actually watch season nine. I was going through it. I know you you joined the show as sort of at, at the first couple episodes. You were kind of uh, um, like uh, a different company that was kind of competing with Mitch and Baywatch, right? <laughs> yeah, they had me more as an adversary. Right, right. And, but then we became like, 
I'd say more flirtatious, uh, sparring, you know, it upped the ratings according to everybody, you know, that, that cared. Um, and, uh, you know, David Hasselhoff, he was just like, you know, if anyone wonders, <laughs> he was such a gentleman and he was so kind to me. And I, I was amazed because, you know, you walk into something that has nine seasons, you think, oh, they, they're used to doing things a certain way and all that. He like, wanted my feedback he wanted like suggestions oh, that's and, cool. you know and they actually i made a pitch because i was working um i was the spokesperson for a charity and called xp which stands for xeroderma pigmentosum which these young kids can't go out in the sun because they have no uv filter in their body and their dna and so I just one day I was thinking about it. I was like, you know, Greg, it'd be interesting if you did a storyline because we're all like out in the sun, enjoying it. No one ever mentions, you know, how great yeah. this is. Some people can't go out in the sun. And um, so they did a storyline on it. It's the episode called Castles in the Sand. Right. I just watched um, that one. So that was your idea. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. What a yeah, cool so thing. Yeah, so just try to bring can, some. Oh. Right. Bring awareness to that. Yeah. <laughs> Some of that underwater uh, footage that we're seeing, uh, you know, we, we know you're, you know, really in the ocean in some of those scenes, but is some of the underwater stuff like shot in a separate, uh, like a pool? A little bit. I didn't, you know, I trained in that pool um, that they have there on the, on the stage. Um, I forget exactly what, which episode it was. I think it's one that we were in a cave or something, but um yeah, I trained in that pool, and actually, I was I was getting certified, um, th- uh, th- my diving certification, and um, you know, swimming in that pool with the tank on and stuff. That's where we were getting our certification. That's why. Oh, okay. And um, but like, there's there's an episode where there was a car crash. It went down into the ravine, something like in the ocean, and it was like I just remember it was like a Friday night. And like the medic told me, like the, we we had to actually be in the ocean. And I think I wore a double wetsuit that night, like I literally two wetsuits on top of each other for warmth. And it was freaking freezing. <laughs> and um, I just remember them telling me like, "Oh, the water's a great sea." And I was like, "Oh," and it's dark there. <laughs> like what? <laughs> but. Um, well, we did it, you know, yeah. and I just remember David Hasselhoff. I was like, sing to, when we were like hanging in the water in between takes and stuff. And I was like, David, sing to me, please. <laughs> and he started singing. He started singing that song. Um, What's your name? Who's your daddy? Is he rich? Is he rich like me? You know, that song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was just like, you know, that's how we that's how we got through it. So. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> I, uh, I, I yeah. think I just, yeah, I remember watching that one. The guy, you, you kind of were under in a cave with him after uh, you rescued him and stuff. And there were some guys after him or something. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Like and that. then yeah. I think, and then I think he turned on you at the end, unfortunately. Yeah, they usually do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I have to ask you about, uh, you know, the first time you slipped into that classic one piece bathing suit. I mean, that was, that's like one of the most iconic uh, swimsuits around. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty wild. <laughs> you know, but they, well, you know, again, I feel very fortunate because, you know, I was a little hesitant about that. And I uh, brought it up to the executive producer and he said, so what would make you feel comfortable? And I'm like, well, if it could be maybe a couple more inches here and a couple more inches there. So they did it. They customized my bathing suit to make it, you know, a little more sporty mm-hmm. um, and which I, you know, I just felt tons more comfortable i wore like previous bathing suits so they were really cool about it when, when you and hasselhoff uh you know there's kind of a love connection there they played with the idea of uh you know you guys getting together and stuff <laughs> i think um you know i don't want to ru- yeah. ruin how it ended but uh because there was the same kind of uh, chemistry between you and rob in uh, silk stockings where it was like would they get together or not and that's something that i think is really tricky to play with uh, for the audience, because they love the relationship as it is, even though they might want you guys to get together, it might change the whole dynamic of the show. A, but also it's like that's kind of like life, isn't it? <laughs> like, <laughs> so true. wanting to get together is so much fun compared to like being together. Um, but Stephen Cannell told me that 
before we started, he said, you guys, it, it's not being done on television. We're a man and a woman are best friends. I mean, you guys are best, best friends and you have each other's back and you will never get together until the show is ending. Yeah. And I go, okay, that's cool. Cause what it did was that it allowed a lot of space for us to play. But what we knew we weren't going to get together. Um, and so like some of those undercover scenes where we had to act like a couple, I think that that was like, you know, yeah, that was... give the audience a little bit of what <laughs> they wanted in fantasy, but not right. know, have it be a day to day thing. It made it a lot of, I think it, it allowed uh, creatively for a lot of other emotions to be able to come in, not just a romantic storyline. Exactly. Know? Yeah. It was, I think it was um, done. Yeah, it was done about as well as it could be done in, uh, in that. You guys were great. Now, um, I did want to ask you about. Uh, thank you, Chris. Sure, absolutely. Now, the um, after Baywatch ended, that was the ninth season of Baywatch. There was sort of like a teaser that the show might move to Australia. And I thought you might be a part of that. What happened there? Well, I, you know, it was interesting. In that one season, we went to Hawaii and shot a two-parter episode. I think it was a two-parter. And then um, towards the end of the season, we went to Australia. And um, that was a pretty cool episode. It was like, the storyline was that it was like a triathlon and like Paul Mitchell on the show was a sponsor. So like while we're running our marathon, there's Paul Mitchell signs everywhere. And he was actually there with his wife in Australia. So mm -hmm. it was really kind of cool. But, um, but I tell you at that point, having a young daughter and uh, being a family person like I am, I had no desire to be 14 hours away from family. <laughs> right. You know, you. that plane ride is a, is a, it's a pretty far thing. I mean, I'd have to move like my entire family. Yeah. There. And, um, but it's interesting because then they ended up, um, not shooting in Australia. They shot in Hawaii, I think. Right. I think. Would that um, have changed anything? So, you think you would have been part of it had you known that? Oh, I don't know. You know, I don't, I, I, I very seldom have second guessed any of my decisions. I'm pretty, happy yeah. the way everything has gone That's <laughs> i feel very fortunate now before we got on air you were telling me that you are now a certified nutritionist so what made you uh, pursue that um i think i mentioned i you know i'm during covid you know it's been a really kind of in a weird way i know a lot of people are struggling and i have deep compassion for like what's going on in certain areas and with certain people and the struggles of businesses and all that stuff. But, you know, I, I, in a lot of ways, and I know a lot of people are saying this, it's like been like a really great deep breath for me and, and my daughters, you know, just, just like kind of, we've just been in quarantine like everyone else. And, um, and so a, it's been beautiful for bonding and creatively and spiritually and all this stuff. It's just like, you know, time to be in nature and yeah. not be in crowds. I love it. But um, so I've, I'm in the middle of developing a project um, that I can't really talk about too much. Um, because, yeah, for NDA reasons, it involves the chief of police, which is kind of cool. So yeah. um, that's nice. And then um, and that's been sort of simmering. But I also I think I mentioned that. Um, you know, I reached a point, well, it's kind of gone on for a while. Different people around me, uh, very close to me, like having ailments. And um, like my dad, with his heart, he had a couple of heart attacks. And um, my other people had, you know, um, they like plaque in their arteries, you know. And it's like, what? What do we do? You know? Yeah. And, and then also a lot of... Um, gastro problems which is like just growing and now because of a lot of you know obvious reason how things are being farmed and animals are being fed and the hormones and all that but without going into that too much so i just um i wanted i would be reaching out to specialists and taking different people to different doctors and like the one thing i kept noticing is that no doctor could really give like i'd say like so then what should 
they'd be eating. And they'd be like, well, I don't know, you know, Mediterranean, you can try that. But it was nothing to really help them. And so I um, ended up getting um, certified, nutrition certified through Cornell uh, late at night, just out of pure uh, wanting to help my family and people around me and friends. Yeah. And um, it's fascinating. I have to say it was fascinating to study. And it's like the program that I did, the largest study that's ever been done on nutrition is the China study. It's a 65 year. So it's not like, oh, just a diet, you know, yeah. fad or something. It's a 65 year study. Yeah. So it goes back. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. Yeah. And it was, it's really fascinating. So having said that, then, you know, I just started you know, making suggestions and seeing like great improvements in people's lives. And um, I just was like, oh my gosh, this is like, it feels so good to be able to be helping them. And through that, then, you know, different people, I'm I'm working with different people now and I'm coaching. I mean, I also, I, you know, I've, I've coached some actors, um, but it, it's interesting because people have reached out to me I think I mentioned to you that like my Instagram uh, official page that people direct message me and we just kind of work that way. And, you know, some people sign up for like a whole program like, for guidance, but then, you know, once they get into like looking at their nutrition, I like, guess like, first of all, it's like, what's your problem or what is it that you want to address? Yeah. You know, what are your issues? And then once we get into that, it has, so many other layers besides just nutrition. It's it's been a really interesting journey because there's you know there's emotional attachments to food. It's not just like from the plate to your mouth, like you know what's the problem. It's like there's also sort of psychological attachments, and right. and then it becomes about so many other things. So um, I'm coaching some different people, not that many, but you know I I don't want to get I don't want to lose sight of what I'm um, also developing, but I'm really enjoying that. And um, I just love being of service in that way and, you know, helping, you know, and seeing people get better right, and that's... feel better. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But so now I've been doing it more professionally because, you know, gotcha. I've helped everyone in my family. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> right. Now you got to, now you got to branch out a little bit. Yeah. So yeah. that's, that's great exactly. though. I mean, that's showing people there's uh, there's alternate ways to, you know, without having to go on medication or things like that, that there are, you know, maybe Absolutely. lifestyle changes that they could do. That. Yeah. I mean, you know, even, yeah, like accountability coach, that kind of stuff. So it, it's kind of all encompassing if that's what you want or just, you know, and like I said, I've even, you know, I've worked with some actors as well because it's like, you know, your body is your instrument, right. really, you know, Absolutely, that all, yeah. you know, taking care of all of it, you know, mm -hmm. so, um, so I'm really enjoying that. And, uh, you know, I, we'll see how long we're in COVID mode and I'll yeah. continue writing and developing on this other project at the same time. So yeah, enjoying yeah. the great outdoors. Right. And I just want to ask you, you know, without going into any detail about your uh, current project, but um, can you, are you kind of like limited right now in how much you can do? Well, you know, I mean, my gosh, the, the beauty of zoom and um, you know, I, I, I'm actually in my super happy place because there's n nothing I just liked more than like rushing through LA traffic stressing to get there on time so now i can in my pajamas throw on the top some you know a necklace and i'm in a meeting it's, it's pretty great it saves a lot of time and a lot of stress i think um so it's not yes there's limitations but yeah so it's it's coming along it's going along and um you know, we'll see. We'll see. I definitely wish you a lot of success with it, and I hope uh, I hope we hear about it pretty soon. Thank you, Chris. You're awesome. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> you coming on the show. This has been uh, really great talking with you. And uh, oh, thanks for having me. Absolutely, anytime. And I wish you a Merry Christmas coming up here. Thank you. Merry Christmas to you. Happy holidays to everyone, and uh, be well and safe. Thank you, Chris. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. You too. Bye bye.